I want to tell you the story of a goat named Hops. We should have seen the warning signs right away. There was an ad on Craigslist, goats for sale. We hopped in the car and drove 45 minutes to a small homestead where a man had a small herd of goats in the back, five or six of them. And yet, only one was for sale, already tied to a stake, separated from the herd. We should have seen it as a warning sign. And for all you future goat owners, buyer beware. If there's only one goat for sale, and yet there are five or six there, there's a reason. She looked good. She looked healthy. She seemed friendly enough. She was a large La Mancha, the breed of goat that looks like it doesn't have any ears. We decided, you know what? She'll be perfect. And we excitedly loaded up our very first goat into the back of our minivan. We drove home talking about the fresh milk we'd be enjoying in just a few weeks because she was pregnant. Now, all of you who already own goats, I know what you're thinking. You should never have a goat by itself. Don't just buy one. You need to have two or three. But she was just about to kid, and so we figured she could last a couple days. We arrived home and unloaded her into the pig pen. There were no pigs at the time, and if there was one place on the farm that I thought would be secure and safe, it was the pig pen. We designed the pig pen to be escape proof. We poured a 10 inch thick concrete slab. And when we poured the slab, we pushed fencing down into the wet concrete so that when the concrete dried, it literally was holding the fencing secure down to the ground. There was no animal that could get out of this. I'd put a minotaur in this pig pen and not have any worries about him ever escaping. So it seemed like a perfect spot to put hops for the night. We unloaded her, closed the gate. There was a hut there that she could sleep in, a big pile of hay on the floor to keep her warm and a roof over her head to keep her dry. We headed inside, excited for the next day. Early the next morning, I came outside, walked all the way down to the pig pen, rounded the corner, the goat was gone. I looked all around the farm. I checked in the other barns, looked at our hay stash, calling and calling for this goat that had no name. What do you say when you're trying to get a goat that has no name to come back to you? Goat, goat, come on goat. We had on our hands, what you might call an escape goat. This is what you can expect. If you're going to get goats, you're going to have stories like this. And today, you're gonna hear a few of them because we're gonna talk about goats on this episode of Homestead. The world that we live in is a crazy place, but you and me, we can each make it a little better. We can live a more sustainable life. We can become more self-sufficient. We can get more connected with the planet around us do all of this together. So everybody, cozy up. It's time for another episode of Homestead. We needed to find this goat, and we couldn't have some wild goat running around our neighborhood. We needed more firepower, so we called our good friends up. My buddy James has a couple of dogs that are trained to track. They specialize in tracking deer and other wildlife. But I figured a goat would be smelly enough to leave some kind of trail, and maybe they could pick up the trail and help us find her. James showed up in about an hour with his two girls, and they hopped out of the car. At first it seemed like there was no trace, but then it seemed like they had picked up something. In fact, they followed a trail right down to the road, and then in the middle of the road, there it was. Goat poop. Let's be honest, goat poop and deer poop are pretty similar, so it probably could have been deer poop, but I was pretty sure that this was our goat, and what we found didn't look good. She'd crossed the road. There was a stream down below, and across the street, my neighbors with an alpaca farm. Maybe she was over there hanging out with the alpacas. So we crossed the stream and headed into my neighbor's property. I asked them if they'd seen her. 
They came outside and helped us look. A few more hours went by, and finally we gave up. There was just no trace. We went inside feeling pretty awful, like this was the biggest failure we'd had yet on our homestead. What could we do? Well, you know what I did next. What any smart millennial who had just lost a goat on his hipster farm would do. I googled how to find lost goat. Call the police station, print out signs and hang them around the neighborhood. Hi, I'd like to report a lost goat. You want to report what, sir? <laughs> yeah, I should have recorded that one. Didn't have a podcast at the time. Then our signs. Big bold letters at the top. Lost goat. Thank goodness for Instagram. I'd snapped a picture of our girl just the day before. Beneath, the phone number to reach us. And then we waited. Who knows, right? We moped around for a few hours. And then suddenly the phone rang. Guess who? The police department. Someone had reported that they'd found a lost goat. They, of course, wanted to make sure that ours fit the description. So where had she gone? Turns out Hops had done just that, hopped over the fencing, and took off across the street, right where we thought, headed through my neighbor's yard and over their mountain, four miles across to another road behind their property to somebody's home. We pulled down their street, walked up to the front door, knocked. I think you have our goat? We couldn't believe it. They led us into the backyard, and there they were. Three other goats. Our goat, Hops, had traveled four miles. I'd imagine being able to pick up the scent of these goats. She didn't want to be alone. She wanted to be with other goats. And she was willing to escape out of our escape-proof pen, cross a street, go through a stream, and four miles over a mountain to find them. So we knew what we had to do. We had to buy more goats. We figured if we could have a goat on our own property that couldn't escape, Hops would stick around. And so we searched Craigslist for the smallest goat we could find. Enter Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo is a bit of a mutt. She was a smaller goat, which meant she definitely would not be able to jump over the fencing. We figured, all right, this goat is the right pick for us. And so we loaded her also up into the back of the minivan and brought her back home to the homestead. We named her Yo-Yo because we figured if Hops were to jump out, she'd always come back, thanks to Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo was now the anchor goat. Yo-Yo turned out to be a great purchase. She's the best goat that we've ever owned. But Hops, Hops didn't work out for us. Eventually, we did, well, you know what. We posted her on Craigslist. And when the man came to buy her, you know what we said. Yep. That one right there, she's the one for sale. The next goats that we brought on were all Nigerian dwarfs. We bought three of them from a friend. They were great quality goats. Wasn't enough for what we wanted for a growing family. Craigslist, then there was the Sonnet. Gallon, that was a bit of an exaggeration. You know what I did. I posted her on Craigslist. Then there was Lido, another La Mancha. I think she's a dog. She's pretty darn annoying. Somehow she's avoided the Craigslist. Then the Nubians, three of them. A couple of them killed themselves off eating poisonous plants. As I go through this list, I find myself asking myself the question. Goats are the worst. Why have I owned so many? Before we get back to that question, I just want to take a minute to tell you guys about a recent development with home study and uh, why I think everything's going to be okay. Uh, so we just wound up losing one of our sponsors. Uh, nobody panic. Uh, here's why. I have serious faith uh, that this Pioneer program is going to be able to help us keep the show going. Home study is a serious time investment. Each episode of this podcast takes me about a week to produce, like full-time job hours. 
And then there's the website and the YouTube channel and all the other stuff. Plus, there's the Pioneer Library, which we are filling with master classes on homesteading and some amazing Homesteady Pioneers only podcast episodes. There are two from this episode about goats that you're going to want to listen to. You'll hear about those in a little bit. So we've lost this sponsor, but that's okay because if you go and become a pioneer, A, you help keep the show going, and honestly, we can't do this show without your help as a pioneer, Uh, but it's not just a handout because then you gain access to the Pioneer's Library, which is full of video and podcasts. There's a ton of masterclasses coming out within the next year. The Pioneer Program is a great program. If you want more home study, head on over to thisishomesteady.com, become a pioneer. If you love home study and you never want it to stop being produced, because honestly, there's always that possibility that it just doesn't work out. If you want it to continue forever, become a pioneer. And that seriously helps us keep doing this show. It's only five bucks a month. And thanks. Yes, we've lost a sponsor, but I'm not worried. I almost feel like now's the time for us to go completely listener supported so you don't have to hear commercials anymore and you can get extra home study through the Pioneer Library. The entire time that we've owned goats, we've tried to have an animal that would provide us with both milk and meat. All these different goats, so much trouble. Why do we bother? because goat milk and meat is actually a lot better than most people think. We once had a blind taste test here at the homestead. I had my parents over and I brought out some goat milk that was fresh and compared it to some fresh cow's milk. In the blind taste test, neither of my parents could tell the difference. Goat's milk can be incredibly good quality and good tasting. And the same can be said about goat meat. But here's the thing, goats are super annoying. They are so much trouble. And so you'll find across the internet world of homesteading, a very polarized world of people who either love their goats, like extended members of the family, or who loathe them, who will never ever own another goat. And then you'll find people like me who can't stand them and who also can't stop buying them. And I don't know why. Often with this show, we try to figure out whether or not this is a good decision for you on your homestead. So are goats a good decision? Can goats be a profitable enterprise on your farm? Are they worth having? Over the last few years, goats have been nothing but one giant thumbs down. I've spent lots of money feeding them hay. I've yielded very little as far as milk or meat. I've had goats escape, destroy. I once raised the question, Are goats really the worst? Meat cow or milk cow? Are goats really the worst? What is the best breed of pig for my place? The answer is yes, absolutely. And this is not like the duck episode where I owned ducks just for a couple months and gave up. This is a man with years and years of goat experience who currently has three out in his backyard. They are the worst. I don't want to try to answer this question with my bias. So I figured... I would ask a few other people about their experiences with goats and whether or not they found them to be a profitable homestead enterprise. I figured maybe I could find a few other people's story to share with Accountant Mike so we could see whether or not you should bring these ridiculous, annoying, goofy animals onto your homestead. Um, and for our listeners to know, you guys cover uh, mostly... It's mostly... It's a, the moment I'd say it's probably a little This bit is Mike and Lauren. They have their own channel over on YouTube called Mike and Lauren. I stumbled upon their channel searching for help with budgeting, and I dove right in. The two of them have great on-camera chemistry, and they put a lot of effort into creating really good quality, short and sweet videos. The channel is full of a lot of different kind of videos. In fact, it's a tough one to pin down, so I'll just let them explain it. Go to YouTube and search Mike and Lauren's channel. There you'll find their about video. Lauren walks into a dark room. She finds an old projector and hits play. Our story is probably one you've heard before. It starts in the summer of 2000. What are you doing? Telling our story. No. Where did you even get that? Craigslist. 
We're not doing the old memories on a vintage projector thing. Why not? It's cute. Yeah, I was hooked. And I'm thinking you probably are too. Here's what you need to know. Lauren and I are what you might call high school sweethearts. She was the first and only girl I ever kissed. She's confident and organized, obsessively punctual, and has a goofy sense of humor. Mike is a no sugarcoating, calm under pressure, always up for adventure, like him if you get to know him kind of guy with a nice butt. Seriously, check out that butt. Lauren likes peanut butter. Mike likes jelly. Lauren reads fiction. Mike reads nonfiction. Lauren is a planner and well, you, you get, get the, the idea. idea. We started making YouTube videos when we left to go backpack Europe for two and a half months and started making videos about money when people asked us how we could afford the trip. We planned to retire before Mike's 31st birthday by saving up just under half a million dollars. Conventional wisdom says to find a niche and stick with it. We say poppycock. We're going to make videos about whatever the hell we want. So buckle up, buttercup, because we're going places and this is the channel to subscribe to if you want to go along for the ride. It's a great channel to subscribe to, and I did so right away. But something caught my eye in that intro video. Obviously, you can't see it because this is a podcast. But in one of the pictures, Mike was holding a goat. And although the channel seemed to focus mostly on DIY projects and some finance, I noticed the reoccurring theme of chickens and goats. And so I dove in deeper because I figured here's a couple who would make a great interview. And now I know how I'm going to get them on the show. We're going to talk about goats. Yeah, uh, well, we actually met when I was, what, 12? Mm -hmm. um, Things went from there. We started dating when I was 15. They got married when they were both pretty young. I was 19, and Mike turned 21 on our honeymoon. They've always been a couple who've done things... It's just a little bit different. Um, Shortly after getting married, they moved to New York City so that Lauren could go to gemology school. Moved into Manhattan, so she got the job at Tiffany. She was making decent money, so I quit my job. Mike toured the country with a quicksand pit. So you can run across this like fluid that's going like this. But as soon as you stop, you sink. But if you stop, you sink. So we called it the quicksand pit. They became entrepreneurial. They started their own biodiesel company. Right before we got married, I went to all the restaurants in our city uh, and asked them to collect their oil and put out 50, 55 gallon barrels and five 300 gallon dumpsters. Then he got into the DVD rental business before Redbox, you, oh, you know yeah. uh, the DVD vending machines? Yeah, yeah. Ordered one of those from China and got it put in a gas station. <laughs> no one knew what like what it was. They didn't trust a machine. The gas station that I put it in went bankrupt. Uh, he also so, had a coffee shop that he opened in that gas station that went bankrupt. Yes. So those two at once oh, oh, oh. failed. Location, failed, location, but I don't... Location. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Renaissance so, man and woman... Probably doesn't begin to describe it. You know the most interesting man in the world, like yeah. commercials that they used to do? No, that wasn't Mike, but he did help with the show. The show was the most interesting show in the world. Oh, so they okay. had a couple cameras. So I learned everything. That was all self-taught. So it probably it didn't come as much of a surprise to anyone who knew them when they decided to backpack Europe. We started, we took a backpacking trip through Europe. We went for two and a half months and brought only one backpack each. And that's where our YouTube channel kind of took off. They never really planned on becoming YouTubers. They just wanted to share their trip. We wanted to show our friends and family how we were traveling. And that's really, that was our intention. was just to show family what we were doing. We had no bigger plans for it. But eventually the channel kind of took off. Because we just are now, this is a new business, basically. We yeah. have been doing our YouTube channel for three, two and a half years now. But we're quitting our jobs a little prematurely to try and go at this full time. And basically treating it as starting a new mm -hmm. business. And it's on this new business of theirs, this YouTube channel, that I stumbled across this video. We thought it'd be a good time to answer the question, does homesteading save money? And this is your second most requested video on our You Pick Our Next Video page. This really piqued my interest. How does a couple who backpacks through Europe suddenly become the owners of goats. It's like a paradox. When I think of backpacking Europe, I think about freedom and enjoying yourself and living moment to moment. And when I think about owning goats, it's like the complete opposite of backpacking Europe. You're constantly worrying about your goats and they're constantly doing jerky things. What could possibly make someone go, hey, backpacking Europe was awesome. Now let's get some goats. I had to find out. We knew, we'd always talked about how we wanted to go backpack Europe. And so we found cheap flight and a transatlantic cruise to Europe that was cheap. And so we kind of were discussing, you know, this is, this is what we want to do. We've always talked about it. Let's book it. And so we booked it 
and then ask permission from our bosses if we could go for two and a half months. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, it worked. They got permission, and off they go to Europe. While they're there... Mike, for some reason, started reading a book about chickens and raising chickens. I, actually, because I, you asked earlier what, how we stumbled upon homesteading, and I think it was just YouTube recommending a video. Like, I was watching videos in Portugal, and it recommended some homesteading video. And I want to say, who who is Polyface Farms? Is it Joe? Yeah, something? Joel Salatin. Uh, Yes, I think it was one of his videos. Uh, so then, you know, got a, got a Kindle book about raising chickens and raising goats and just got super into that. I wonder how many people stumble across Joel Salatin and within a six-month period suddenly own chickens and goats. Mastermind. But he's not totally to blame. And also just being in Europe where their food standards are so much better than mm -hmm. here in the States without all these added unnecessary and bad for you ingredients it kind of opened our eyes to what's happening here isn't normal so to know where our food came from started to be and that's been a pattern us. for us for a little while is being frustrated with the quality and not knowing the source of our food here and the laziness of <laughs> fixing it yourself and actually doing something about it so uh when we got back from europe we had, we we decided let's actually do something about it that is modern day homesteading in a sentence learning about your food, learning about the problems with the food system, and deciding, you know what, now I'm going to do something about it. I know even McDonald's, which we don't need a McDonald's here in the States. I couldn't tell you the last time I, I had McDonald's, but... I love how suddenly defensive Lauren got at mentioning eating at McDonald's. It has a connotation. When we were there, I had been reading articles about how the... French fries here at McDonald's in the States have just a grocery list of different ingredients. And there it's very simple potatoes and salt <laughs> salt, and nothing else. So I said, I think we might need to go try McDonald's. I want to see if I can taste the difference. And so even just starting there, these ingredients that are banned there and not they're not allowed in food are perfectly fine here. And no one's kind of stopping that. And that opened our eyes to how just frustrating that is to try to get something different. It is harder to find something different or better, and that's what leads a lot of us to this life of homesteading, like it did Mike and Lauren. Because the reality is that McDonald's here in the United States doesn't serve good quality food. You know what else it doesn't serve? They also served wine at McDonald's, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Those Europeans always showing us up. It was just the right time, right place at the right time to try something new. And so they did. They jumped into the world of homesteading. And it all started somewhere in a creepy part of town. All right, so I have a note I wrote down here. You can't probably read it, but it says creepy chicken pickup. You picked them up oh, yeah. under an overpass. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. How did this play out? It's like a mob uh, or a drug deal going down. We were looking for Rhode Island Reds, and they popped up on Craigslist. I was just very specifically looking for older Rhode Island Reds just about ready to lay. Someone showed up. and Seven of them. And he just said, hey, you want to meet here on uh, I-75 in Jacaranda under the overpass? I said, okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he showed That's up. Like he had a truck. They were all in nice cages. I mean, I guess maybe he does it for a living, I guess. I don't know. That's like the yeah. creepiest chicken pickup, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll meet you under the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got the money? I don't know. You got the stuff? <laughs> Is that how it played out? Pretty oh, much, yeah. <laughs> so they bought a bunch of chickens on Craigslist. You know what else they found on Craigslist? Goats. This episode of Home Study is brought to you by Craigslist. Because thanks to Craigslist, we all have annoying goat stories. Thanks, Craigslist. Why, I don't know if we talked about it yet, why did you decide to get goats? Was it just you wanted goats? It was, it was because we were losing chickens. I, Because even I remember Mike started looking at different things that we could get uh, to help to deter predators and 
he was talking about dogs, llamas, or goats. And, and goats produce milk. Goats so. produce milk, which was why... And I, I remember fighting him on this. I, I did not want goats. I was not interested in them. It just seemed ridiculous that we were going to get goats. And then I saw the baby goats and I was done. And it was terrible timing, too, because I was working retail. And we found this opportunity with the goats two weeks before Christmas, which is the worst time in retail oh, to man. say we're going to get baby goats and yeah. have to formula feed them. So I wasn't happy about that. But again, baby goats. So <laughs> there was that. You called it this opportunity with goats. How did that? How did you find the goats? Craigslist. Craigslist again. <laughs> right. Yep. Uh, we knew we wanted Nubian because we wanted the milk, uh, and that we knew that they d would do well in our Florida climate. And on Craigslist, there was a woman who had several Nubians and just had another um, another one give birth, and mm -hmm. they had more than they they could handle. So it was, I think we paid seventy five dollars for them, and mm -hmm. it was adorable. <laughs> oh, they were so, so cute. Yeah. Because we got to go meet them when they were only two days old, and then Mike went back down to pick them up at two weeks old. Letting you see them at two days old, that's called marketing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a hook, line, and sinker right there. Yes. Yep. We'd go out and sit in the yard, and they'd come and try to climb in our laps, and they right. were just really fun. Blanche and Doris. Blanche and Doris turned out to be a good addition to their homestead. They served as livestock guardian goats, keeping hawks and other predators away from the chickens. And for almost two years, Mike and Lauren lived the homesteading life. But eventually, their restless souls kicked in. They started to want to travel again. It was a really hard decision because we were coming up to where they needed to be bred so that we could start getting milk because at this point we were just putting money into them and our whole plan was that we would eventually get them pregnant sell the babies and have milk that we could sell and that was how we would start generating some income from the goats and the it just got to be too much we were traveling too much already just to have them but then to add in oh by the way you got to milk the goats three times a day if you're gonna Love watch that. them just yeah. it's a surefire way to lose volunteers to watch the farm and so they decided they had a friend who already had a homestead in goats who was interested they would give the girls to him so we did an exchange where we gave him the goats and he gave us uh, milk. So. And we still get to go see them and they've since yeah. both had babies. So yes. we get to go and visit from time to time, so now, which is nice. Yeah. So, so they grand, have their own little baby goats. goats. We have grandkids. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, grandkids. Um, yeah. That's cool. So it worked out. You actually got some milk from the goats. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, how, what did you think of the quality of Nubian milk? It's. I mean, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the we were hoping what we really wanted was some goat cheese, yes. and he never got around to that. Uh, so uh, we're still waiting on some some backlog of goat cheese yes. that's owed to us. <laughs> but, so the yeah. goats were adorable, but they didn't get much back from them. What does their breakdown actually look like? Well, fortunately for us, they had a video over on their YouTube channel that we could sit and watch together and get some hard data as to whether or not goats were a profitable and good financial decision for them on their homestead. All right, here we go. Does homesteading save money? That yep. was the one. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. There it is. All right, let's see. We have about 18 months of data to go off of, and it's revealed some interesting information mm -hmm. about uh, having goats in your backyard, having chickens in your backyard, and gardening. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So I looked everything up, and in total, we spent about $900 to buy our goats, to build the fence for our goats. Literally everything you could, we spent on our goats, we spent $900. And goat milk in our area is about $10 per gallon. So we would need to buy 90 gallons worth of goat milk for that to make sense financially. And that doesn't account for our time. Those did not really work out financially. No, and really they were our pets and the reason that we gave them away wasn't even to do with the cost it was just that we didn't have time with all of our travels so that was the hardest part was that they took so much time mm -hmm. but i do think you could turn goats into a business that mm -hmm. ten dollar per gallon goat milk price is on craigslist and if you had goats you could easily make money from having goats second uh in the aftermath have you got 90 gallons of goat's milk 
Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> no. We uh, we honestly just enjoy, you know, that they're in a loving home. Right. And he's trying to make a business out of it himself. Mm-hmm. So, we actually just tried making fudge from yeah. goat milk. Yeah. So cool. I'm interested to see how that turned out. Yeah. So we've uh, just kind of let that kind of go and let him be mm-hmm. happy with the goats. Uh, but... No, we were nowhere near profitable on that, even with the arrangement that we came up with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Cause so looking back, Mike and Lauren realized that there's no way they could describe owning their goats as a profitable experience. However, it doesn't mean they think it was a failure. Having done this for two years, you try different stuff. You have these big dreams. Some things work, some things fail. Mm-hmm. Um, do you look back at the homesteading two seasons as a failure, do you look back as a success? What were the failures? What were the successes? Let's go together here and see if we're on the same page. One, two, three, success. success. Yes, high five. Nice. Uh, yes, I think it was a success. Uh, we learn chickens, and you said you know we'll talk about this later. Was a success both, uh, you know, health wise mm-hmm. and financially. Uh, after we ran the numbers on it. Goats were a horrible disaster financially, <laughs> but, but we love. I still talk. I mean, about it's the how same as your dog a, yeah. a financial disaster or unsuccessful. No, it was they were pets, and um, we we just loved them. Mm-hmm. Mike and Lauren have had the same experience with goats that we have. They've pretty much been a money pit. All best laid plans kind of fell through. Before I go in and present this to Accountant Mike, I needed some sort of argument, some sort of way to prove to him that even still. There is a way to look at it where it's worthwhile. Mike had some Something good advice. You, this is my argument when I have my accountant buddy on and we go back and forth. My argument is always at the end of the day, whether or not it makes money on my farm, if I enjoy doing it and I feel mm-hmm. good at the end of the day, well, then it's it's worked out for me. If I don't enjoy it and my cucumbers are rotting on my countertop, well, then... <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a different and we story. have a video about called um, "How much is your free time worth?" Where oh, cool! You have yeah, you have to look at um, is the experience pleasant, neutral, or a negative experience for you? And so, at what point, you know, do you hire someone to mow your lawn, or is that a neutral experience? You know, you get a little bit of exercise outside. Uh, maybe you don't, you wouldn't do it if you didn't, if you had the option, but. I wouldn't call it a negative experience, whereas maybe you say washing your car is a negative experience. You hate waxing. So something like that for you might be worth paying someone to wax Mm -hmm. your car. The gist of the video is you can't take your hourly wage and apply it to your free time because the alternative is sitting on the couch and watching TV. It's not the same. All my audience knows that mowing the lawn is not neutral. It is negative to me. (laughs) I (laughs) bought sheep, so I didn't have to do that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Mike and Lauren no longer have a homestead. Uh, They talk about it in the video. They got rid of all the chickens, the garden, the goats, but it doesn't mean they're done for good. I mean, I know for us, it's important to us uh, that we do try it again. Um, And it's really just like I was talking about, once you experience that connection with seeing where your eggs are coming from Mm -hmm. and seeing where, you know, even if we only had, you know, five or 10 salads, from that lettuce in our garden it tastes so much better right coming from something you worked at uh you know i guess that's a life lesson in general you know something you put the work in yourself you appreciate it a lot more mm-hmm. than something that's a handed to you or b served to you cheaply on a plate um yeah, yeah that's what i would say is the experience was really valuable to us mm-hmm. and something we're definitely going to do in the future I know you as well as you know me And it's just so good to see That this is how we said it all would Mike and Lauren's homestead adventure is all done But they have another amazing adventure planned for this upcoming year They're going to be moving into an RV And traveling around the country Doing DIY projects with their fans on YouTube Make sure to go and check out Mike and Lauren's channel on YouTube, follow their journey, and hopefully somewhere along the road, we'll be able to meet up with them again. You can find everything Mike and Lauren have to share on YouTube. Just search Mike and Lauren.
Mike, Lauren, and I went on to talk about their endeavors in gardening and in raising chickens. Here's something incredible. They found a way to make chickens profitable. The numbers totally worked out for them. They actually saved money on chicken eggs. If you want to know how they did this using the help of Craigslist and some DIY elbow grease, uh, become a homesteady pioneer. The rest of this interview can be found in the Pioneer Library where we chatted all about gardening, raising chickens, and how in the world Mike and Lauren were able to make raising chickens a profitable enterprise and why they're going to do it again. They also share some really great tips on buying on Craigslist and knowing how to price things and knowing how to figure out what the real value of something on Craigslist is so you make sure you're getting a good buy. Become a Homesteady Pioneer. You'll gain access to that bonus podcast as well as our entire library of Pioneers-only podcasts, master class in homesteading, videos, and so much more. Head on over to thisishomesteady.com and become a pioneer. You'll help support the show and get a whole lot more homesteady. So if there's something that we've learned from both my experience and Mike and Lauren's, it's that having goats as kind of like a pet with benefits doesn't really pay off. There's no way I can bring this to Accountant Mike and get any hopes of getting a thumbs up. I was just about ready to give up. Figured this was a pretty good episode as it was. I had a lot of fun talking with Mike and Lauren. Maybe we should just call it. Forget about Accountant Mike altogether. And then I stumbled across a certain account on Instagram. Someone who had pictures of lots and lots of goats crawling across California hillsides. And she seemed to have a pretty good business based off this entire goat production. Can this person come up with a plan to make goats profitable? Could they show us a way to get a thumbs up from Accountant Mike? Find a way to make goats actually a worthwhile experience? Well, you'll have to wait and find out on part two of the goat episode coming out soon. Make sure to subscribe to Home Study so you don't miss it. And until then, remember, the road is rocky. Make Home Study. <laughs>